everyone, this is Amanda Schoenblatt. Welcome to another episode of Interview with Miss Panda. This conversation with me is with Anna Gilcher and Rochelle Adams. They are master teachers of foreign languages. Anna teaches French and Rochelle teaches Spanish. They're both amazing world language teacher, professional development trainers. And I'm so happy to have them here with us today. And Rochelle is the founder and co-director, and Anna is the co-director of Elevate Education Consulting. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. It's so wow. Nice to you know, there are so many things we can talk about and to start with. But look at your, your classroom. Is this your classroom? Yeah, this is my classroom. Welcome to the Spanish classroom. Wow, I see. How do you call that? All the posters and all the words? Um, I call it providing my students what they need to communicate, but mm -hmm. in a simple word, like it's a word ball, right? I give them the words that they need to help engage in communication in the classroom. That's right. And okay, Anna is, the, uh, Anna is the French teacher, the trainer, and also you speak German and also um, Spanish. Spanish. So Rochelle teaches Spanish. So we would like to um, to know a little bit story behind your love for languages. Yeah. Okay. You want to go first? Okay. Well, um, my father actually speaks um, several languages, so I grew up knowing that that was possible and that it was something that I wanted. My father always spoke, uh, in addition to English, French, and German. So I knew that those were real languages being used like with real people, <laughs> and I always wanted to be able to understand what was going on. Uh, so I started taking French in middle school, uh, and then when I was in high school, I had a teacher who was from Haiti, and he spoke French in class, and it was interesting because I was an AFS student, I was an exchange student when I was 16, and lived in France for a year. And when I got there, um, I had been, I had gotten good grades in French, but I never put in a lot of extra time on the homework. I never wanted to memorize things. Um, but I found that I was understanding and um, communicating better than a lot of my peers when I got to France. And it's only now looking back, I realize it's because he provided me with compelling comprehensible input by speaking French in a way that I could understand in the classroom and by being someone that I wanted to listen to. So even when I wasn't getting all my verb endings correct or I wasn't feeling like I wanted to memorize the lists of vocabulary that he was giving us homework, he was continuously providing uh, French in a way that, that I was interested in throughout our classes. Um, so I lived in France for a year um, when I was 16 with a family um, and went to high school there and that really changed everything in my life. That's the point, there's really a before and an after um, because when I got back and then started college I already spoke French. That was part of my identity um, and at that point I started taking German because we have family in Germany that I wanted to be able to talk with. And I knew that I could learn a language. So once mm -hmm. I had really acquired French and owned that, um, I knew that any language I decided to um, engage with, that I would be able to do it. Um, right. So I was in Germany for a semester later, and then by the time I was in graduate school, I thought it was embarrassing that someone who knew that she could learn languages had not learned Spanish. So I uh, started taking classes with my graduate student colleagues. Um, in the Department of Romance Studies at Duke and uh, acquired uh, Spanish through the classes combined with watching a lot of TV novelas on Univision. Nice. <laughs> That's a good story. So actually, you actually grew up with different languages. Is that correct? I could hear them around me. I didn't, I didn't grow up like acquiring them myself, but they were, they were around me. And I so kind of like a passive in the family, basically at your home, because you mentioned your father actually would speak um, different language at home? Not, yeah, but not to me, right? So it was that we were an English-speaking household, but he was always on the phone or we would travel and he would be using these other languages and he was able to interact with all sorts of people and I wanted that. That is really, really interesting. Okay, so how about Rochelle? Can you share your story with us? <laughs> yeah, mine is a very different story. So I'm the only person in my family that speaks another language and again was somebody who started learning in school and did not fare very well in the traditional language system in terms of grades, 
but it was something that I fell in love with. And I grew up in a part of New York where I did have access to other Spanish speakers in their homes with their relatives. And so it was compelling for me to know how to be able to thank aunties or grandmothers or other people for the wonderful food that they were providing me. <laughs> and um, I don't know, it was just a, a younger version of myself just sort of saw to the future that it was something I would need. It wasn't until I got to the AP level where I was able to get language in full, whole context in literature and poetry. Poetry is what pulled me deep, deep in. And I just kept at it, and, um, no matter how much it killed my GPA, I didn't care. <laughs> and uh, then continued on and studied uh, all through undergrad. Uh, and was able to then, I mean, it's where I live, uh, Spanish is a daily practice for me, so. Wow. Well, that, that's a very, very different. But, but I think, you know, that the passion actually leads to, you know, teaching actually afterwards because you both are amazing teachers. And then um, when we talk about, you, you both mentioned, like, make things comprehensible. And uh, uh, that's very important. And like your, whatever we see right now, the word wall and, um, and Rochelle is teaching Spanish and that's very important for her to let her students, you know, see all that. So can you talk about what is comprehensible input? Nowadays we hear a lot about that, that but how do we use that in the world language classroom? And yeah. Right. Well, first of all, uh, I think it's really important to know that, that comprehensible input is a philosophy. It's not a strategy um, and it's not a method. It answers the question about how language acquisition occurs. So no matter who you are, you acquire language through comprehending the input that you get. Um, and so I, um, right now, because people are starting to use the term so much, it's, I think that started to be confusing. People will say like, oh, do you do CI? Well, any, any language that's acquired has been done through comprehensible input. The question is, do we create an environment in which we are emphasizing input, a comprehensible input in our classrooms and making that the center of what we do. Mm -hmm. Right, and then when we talk about comprehensible input, a lot of times the TPRS will come in picture as well. So what is TPRS, if you can mention that a little bit? Yeah, so I think what Anna was saying before is the clear picture. So CI is the umbrella. Comprehensible input is how we learn. TPRS, or teaching profici proficiency through reading and storytelling, is a strategy. It's a way of providing comprehensible input. It's so, a whole entire method, right? Even, right? Yeah. So it's a whole method that follows a particular way of engaging students in stories. And yeah. our brains are wired to learn through stories. We learn a whole lot of things through them. Mm -hmm. But even more importantly, we learn language through story easier and far richer than we do in any other way. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. The other piece I would just add in is that um, one of the things Bill Van Patten has been really addressing lately, um, and he is a, an important linguist who has been also making the bridge between uh, linguistics professionally right. and uh, teachers. Classroom <laughs> teachers. Classroom yeah. teachers. And he has a great show uh, that used, used to have a show called Tea with VVP, and now it's called, it's got a new one, same idea podcast called yes. Talk and How To. And he talks about communicatively embedded input. So I just want to put a plug out there for really all, all, anything we do has to be embedded in communication, right? Yeah, so the correct. input has to be comprehended, yes, and communicatively embedded. And stories are a great way to make that happen. Yes, yeah. That's right. So we're talking about the, the big umbrella is the comprehensible input. It's a philosophy. And then we talk about TPRS. It's a strategy. It's teaching proficiency through uh, reading and the storytelling. And then we're talking about stories can be very engaging to the students. So actually, and then we're also talking about, you know, everything we do should be communicative. Okay, and then the input. And a lot of times people are talking about why we also talk about input, not output. I think you are the math teachers. So I think we need to know why. <laughs> yeah, well, because what we've learned through just years and years of research on this is that output um, is not what the brain needs to deeply acquire the language. What it needs is lots and lots of hearing or reading of it. Um, and so what we do is we work to make sure that they understand and comprehend, right? 
So as a classroom teacher, I'm really looking to see that my students are comprehending the information. And that's what I assess, but then I just celebrate production from time to time when it happens. And just like when we learn our mother tongue, our first language, we understand way more than we're able to produce at the outset. And by forcing production too early, it doesn't really do anything to help the brain and the body acquire the language. Um, when it starts to just come naturally because they've heard it in context and in communication so frequently, then that's when we're like, all right, look at you. It's the natural byproduct of the language that has been, yes. uh, that is being mentally represented in the head. The only way to get mental representation is through uh, communicatively embedded input. There is no other way. Yeah, well, I think that's one thing I also talk about because I also teach young children. You both also teach young children. A lot of times I tell parents, I say, well, you know, you wait about a year for your baby to speak the first word. So you definitely can wait to let your kids to, you know, listen and do a lot of things in the second language. And when they are ready, when they hear a lot, the repetition yeah. they will produce. I think that's probably very similar in the first language acquisition and the second language acquisition. A lot of the input. Yeah, exactly. One of our great colleagues, Jason Fritz, who's an elementary uh, teacher of Spanish, he says this, he says, you know, we are language parents. We are not language teachers. So if we take on this role of treating our students the way we do our little people, like our babies or our nieces and nephews or our friends' kids, and we take on this role of being language parents, then we get into this celebration mode. And we make sure that they're understanding and that they're going at the pace that's right for their, their brain and how language acquisition works. So That's wonderful. That, I think it's just so well said. Language teacher, they're actually language parents. Yeah, I think if you think that way, it's a lot of fun, actually, to anticipate the first word from your students. Is that wonderful? That is celebration. Yeah, so my next question for you is that... What is the biggest difference between the traditional word language classroom and a comprehensible input classroom? Okay, so for me personally, I think that the, the biggest difference is that in a classroom that is focused on providing comprehensible input through communication, there is so much more fun happening. So <laughs> that's thing one. Um, what the really the big, big difference is in a traditional or in a what we're calling legacy classroom of language teaching, we spend a lot of time talking about the language, explaining grammar rules, verb endings, um, you know, those types of things, but we don't spend a lot of time really talking in the language with our students. Um, and another piece of it is that the, the paradigm that the legacy classroom is working from is the idea that we need to present something and we need to practice it. And by practicing it, we will then get it. Right. And that's um, the comprehensible input classroom, which reflects what we know about how the brain actually acquires language, flips that the other way, right? It's by understanding that we'll acquire, it's by acquiring that we'll have what we need to say what we need. Right? It is not through presenting it and practicing it that we get there. Yep. Right. And then so we're talking about like, if you hear something repeatedly again and again, then you all have it. Instead of drilling the students, say, well, let's follow the sentence pattern, say it a hundred times or write it 50 times. Mm -hmm. Though that will be, we're talking about the legacy teaching method a lot of times because that's how they do that. And then I, we're talking about in a very different direction. Exactly, and, when, and one of the things that they, we have to make sure we're remembering is it's hearing things in a communicatively embedded context, right? So if I just say to you over and over and over and over and over something, that if, you're, if it's not communication, it doesn't get acquired. The language acquisition device does not take it in, right? So we could say, oh, but in the way that I used to teach back in the day, I used to make sure my students heard that pattern over and over, right? But that's really still with the intention of getting them to master it, the intention needs to be communication, right. not the intention being, let's make sure you master the structure. It really matters, and it's very different effect on the brain. Yeah. It's kind of cool, it's like the neuroimaging that happens, what parts of the <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big yes. neuroscience fan. And so the parts of the brain that light up when we're repeating things over and over as a sentence or a phrase, 
is shallow. And when we're talking in real communication, it's deep. Like other regions of the brain are lighting up and active. So you are talking about the summertime, you have ice cream with the kids. And then suddenly you always talk about ice cream, different flavors repeatedly. And suddenly they come to you and say, ice cream. Yeah. They try to communicate with you. So it, it is, it has meaning actually. It's not just a word, but it has meaning. It, it has a fun element. It has different flavors. They have a different things. So basically from one thing, you can branch out to so many different things. So we see the legacy uh, classroom and then the comprehensible input classroom, actually, they can be so different, but in a very more fun and also communicative way. But does that mean that teachers have to do a lot of preparation? And how, how does that work? Here's the secret, okay? <laughs> secret, let's all lean in. Secret, you do far less preparation in a CI communication-based classroom than we ever did trying to come up with worksheets or printables or grading. Because what you end up doing is you follow the flow of the communication naturally, and you're just engaging with the interests of the students. Now, I always have a little something, something in my back pocket in case they're like, uh, and I'm like, oh no, I thought this conversation was going to be amazing. And they're like, no, it's so amazing. So maybe I have already um, planned to have a song on deck or I'm like, oh, here's a book, kids. Let's all read for a second, you know? <laughs> um, but in general, the planning goes down uh, in terms of minutia over verb lists or word lists the stress goes down and then the joy goes up for both the students and the teacher, right? And those things are symbiotic. When you got a stressed out, overworked, overplanned teacher, you often have kids that are like, oh no, you're stressed out, overworked and overplanned. <laughs> I'm stressed now, right? Yeah. yeah, we really catch these things body to body, right? So when someone walks into a room with a lot of intense stress, then other bodies catch that. Whereas when we walk into the room with a lot of ease and joy and pleasure, and uh, then, then that is end up, mm -hmm. ends up happening in the classroom. It's also a really eco-friendly way to teach. Right, right. right. you don't have a lot of printouts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd say at first, you know, it does take a real mindset, right. mindset change. And at first I did a lot of planning um, because it was really a different way to think. So I would create a lot of questions in advance so that I knew where to go. Because if you try to just do this without having had the experience, if you haven't been a student in a CI classroom, it's gonna, it takes a while to get used to what the, uh, what the strategies are what the, and what the techniques are that allow you to be comprehensible. Because just talking with your students, especially at a lower level, is not gonna work because they're actually not gonna be understanding you. Um, and it's not going to be interesting for them if they're not understanding. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So the things that we work on with teachers is how to actually do this um, once you get that it's what you want to do. That's right. I, I think that's one thing I actually want to mention. I am going to um, talk about it. Is like you actually teach language teachers language, which means the language teacher, French language teacher, can teach French with you, but actually in a comprehensible input environment and then to show them how that can be done in a real classroom. Yeah. And so the power live demo. Yes. Yes. So we do short demos and then we also both teach online so that teachers can experience like A, just get to learn another language, which is always like pretty Fun. amazing, right? <laughs> and to get to see how how it really what the experience is of learning that language in this way, see how painless it is how fun it is, yeah. and then have those lived experiences to take into their own classrooms. I, I think the best part is like the teacher can be in the student's shoes yeah. and to actually see how that feels when the classroom is flipped around from the legacy teaching method to the comprehensive in input, you know, communicative kind of way of doing it. So I think that is really awesome to, to see that. And then now I think we do a little show and tell. Are you ready for some show and tell? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe can you show us some of the tools you actually use in class so the teachers, educators, even parents can learn from you? Okay, well, since we're in the Spanish classroom, I'll do a little show and tell about Spanish. So behind me is part of the classroom. It's one word wall of many. 
And what I've done in this particular area is I've given people everything that they need to be able to talk about when something is happening, right? We can talk about maybe when in the year it's happening, when in the week, what time. And then also related to that is just like how many, right? So how many people went to the event or how many different concerts have you gone to this year or in your life, whatever it is. So I try to make sure that it's um, grouped in a way that makes sense in terms of communication, right? So I could have a bunch of question words all on one part of the wall, which works just fine for the brain. Um, for me, I was lucky I had them separated out, so I chunked them. Uh, and the reason why I have a prepared space is because it allows me to just point, pause, it slows me down, and then it gives the brain a chance to rest. They can see that it's, you know, Saturday in English, but all I'm saying to them is Sabado. So we remain in the target language the whole time in terms of what they're hearing. They can see it written, which enforces the spelling and reading comprehension, right? And they can then later have a movie in their head playing when they're reading and they understand what it means. Um, so I'll give you a quick 360 tour. So this is the when wall, and then we'll tour over here. That's the where wall with the maps. And then goes into what and which and who. And the language that I'm giving them are expressions that they can use to again, just talk about what's happening throughout their day. So that's my, my basic stuff. I've worked in all kinds of different contexts. So I've done this um, same thing in versions that were mobile. Mike, I had my little pack of things and I went and um, I still do this in some respects. The other thing that I always have in my classroom um, are books to read. So these are leveled readers. And then also kids books, right? Um, and I'm really intentional about what are the kinds of books that I'm picking up because I want to make sure that they will lead to um, interesting discussions where I get to know more about my students, right? Some of them are just fun, right? When we learn and read about Elephant and Piggy, that's just fun. Uh, yeah. And it's simple and it's great and everybody loves to watch Elephant and Piggy have a discussion, right? And then I flip over to books that are maybe a little more out of reach for the younger levels, but I select and choose. And I do a lot of picture talk around what's in there. I ask them questions about themselves with personalized questions and answers. Um, some of the other things I like to keep around are props. So I have a bag full of Beanie Babies that I bought at the thrift store, washed and now used because nobody wants to pay for a Beanie Baby fresh out of the factory. There's no need. <laughs> exactly. I promise you there are hundreds of homeless Beanie Babies around the country that need you to bring them into your classroom. Yeah. So, um, so those are kinds of those things that I always have on hand. Uh, I also generally always have um, colored pencils and markers in case we want to break out and do something where I have them draw out an answer or in the case of this book that I've been doing with um, El Mapa de los Buenos Momentos, the maps of the good times, uh, I have students draw their own maps, <clears throat> things like that. So, and then my handy dandy whiteboard. So, and a couple of things that I have, I have all those same things. I have a more of a mobile classroom because I teach out of my living room. And so I put everything up and take it down every time I teach. So mm -hmm. I have um, uh, posters like this, but I have them uh, backed onto cardboard and then I take them down each day. So for people who have to travel from classroom to classroom, that's something that can be really helpful. I just have a pile and then I can take it anywhere. Um, I also always have my bell. And so one of the things you started with, Amanda, was like that we should all breathe. So that, as you know, is one of the main first things I teach people in French when I start teaching is on respire, we breathe. And then I use my bell from time to time, not all the time. We breathe a lot more than I ring the bell, but it's another wonderful way to bring us back to the present moment. Um, another thing I just have in my bag always is um, just this little 
story cube uh, <laughs> game. Yeah. So they're all little pictures, um, and uh, we could take just one and start a story with it, just roll it, or I can pass them out and different people roll them and we do it one sentence. Like there's lots of ways to use them. I just used them yesterday in a class where I noticed that we, that there, we needed a little something to center on for a while. And I don't do stories every day anymore, but I like the, the power of story is really um, incredible. And so uh, from time to time, this is a way that I'll start a story um, and then we write it down or retell it and then I'm gonna type it up later. So those are some different things that we have to have around. And they always have lots of books. Yes. We start with free reading at the beginning of every one of my classes for 10 minutes. Same here. Um, so I have a lot of books. To, I put a lot of money and time into choosing books so that I have a large collection of different books for people to choose from. And I have found that that has made one of the biggest differences in my teaching is to have that 10 minutes of reading where I read in French also. I read the book I'm reading and then they read in French um, and they can either continue with the book they started last week or do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been really fun. Yeah. And music. That's music. Really cool. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you for the tour of the Spanish classroom. And one question I have for the word wall is that I see Spanish and I also see English and we talk about that and then I think a lot of parents and teachers they sometimes say well we need to give them a lot of target language okay for example Spanish class so only Spanish why we have English on the poster that's a great question um, so it's there in order to alleviate confusion right that's the only thing it's there for and it just means that the person who is hearing and seeing the input in Spanish doesn't have to um, be lost or spend a lot of time trying to figure out what in the heck I meant. Some things I keep both English and Spanish up just to have it because I have mixed levels of students in the classroom. So for my lower level students, they always have exactly what they need. For my upper level students, they eventually begin to not see the English, right? It just goes away. It's amazing what happens in the brain because once they have it, they have it, and it doesn't hurt them to have it up there. Um, so it helps keep me in the target language, and it gives them the brain rest that they need. And not absolutely everything has both, but uh, a good chunk of it does. So that when they're looking and reaching for something that they want to communicate, they have it right there. Yep. And I also think actually it actually reduced the stress for lower level students, beginner students, not beast level students, because they're just beginning and yep. sometimes they need a little bit help with the native language. So I think with both language there actually will reduce the stress. Is that exactly. a part of the benefit? Yeah. And we do know that if, um, if we don't provide it for them, they're busy creating that in their head anyway. Yeah. So we might we might imagine that by not having any English in the room, we are creating this perfect environment of French or Spanish or Chinese, but in their heads, they're busy going, does that mean orange? Does that mean purple? Does that mean wall? Does that mean, so they're busy doing that. And we've all had the experience where we're a bit irritated with our students because they're like yelling out things that they think it means. And we're like, no. And then we're trying to act it out. And we're like, no, you know, and then we spend, you know, five minutes trying to act something out that we could have just clarified by making it clear right from the very beginning. So we need to not think that the brain doesn't make that uh, translation in the head because it will do it anyway, so we might as well give it to them. And then they could stay with us in the target language. And as Rochelle was saying, she's able to stay in Spanish because she can point to that. That keeps her in Spanish. Yeah. Well, that actually applies to my Chinese class as well, because I have the word wall, and then students, they can just, if they don't understand, they can refer to the wall, but I can keep focusing on the Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. So actually, they got more target language input. I think that's definitely very important. So we see you have word wall, you have readers, you have kids books, and then you found the books and stories, you lead to discussion, and you learn more about your students. And then we talk about picture talk, because sometimes students, they won't be able to, you know, read a book all by themselves. And then, so we just have to choose one picture at a time and talk about it. And that actually makes the discussion and learning a lot of fun. 
and you have props or like mini babies and um, definitely I have a two boxes of all kinds of stuffed animals. Yeah. So see, we are all very, we have to, you know, like a child heart. We are fun and we want to make sure the language class is fun. That's how students learn, no matter how old they are, as a matter of fact. And we talk about color pencils, markers, and uh, story cubes. I think that was, that is fantastic. This is definitely a great tool. It makes kids feel very excited to roll the dice to see what they're going to talk about. And they also have it. <laughs> yeah, me too. The teachers are all very excited too, right? It's unpredictable. Everybody likes surprises. So we want to, I always say we want to give surprises in the language classroom so kids can be very they want, they, they're expecting or they are looking forward to your class because it's so much fun. They want to keep learning and to lead them to, to learn on their own and then we become the facilitator for, for the program. I, I think that's, can we, can, we, can we say that? Can we put that that way? We are language facilitators. That's exactly what we are, language facilitators. That's the role of being a language parent. That's right. <laughs> and then, you know, we talk about the bell. That's very important. So that definitely give us a break or give us a way to de-stress and to start fresh. So I, I love the, the tools you, you have, you have presented to us. And I think that's fantastic. But a lot of times, you know, people, well, wonder, okay, we, it seems a lot of fun, but where is grammar? in the comprehensible input world language classroom. Where is grammar? <laughs> Everywhere. That's a great question. Yeah, so grammar, um, grammar that's actually in our heads that we use to speak a language with, like we're doing right now, is acquired. It's not learned explicitly. So I could spend a whole lot of time teaching Rochelle um, how to conjugate a verb or how to, you know, when to use qu'est-ce and when to use qu'est-ce and when to use qu'est-ce and when to use qu'est-ce. That was actually a lesson in my textbook <laughs> long ago. And she, even if she were able to do the exercises, she would not have access to any of that information when she's speaking French. Right. It's a different process. So um, grammar is acquired through communicatively embedded input. That's how it works. Now, there can be a role once language is acquired and we have mental representation in our heads, then we can use explicit teaching to uh, look at spelling, to look at patterns, um, but that is really not the same thing, right? That is, that is how you write. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, and we know that with native speakers, um, elementary school, a lot of the role of elementary school is helping with writing. Right, so reading, but then writing, and how do you uh, also have a professional level of your native language, right? Mm -hmm. There's your home dialect or the way that you speak at home or with your friends, and then there's how you speak at a different register. So all of those things, um, we can then look a little bit more at like grammar in the way that we think of grammar at that time. But easy does it, little bits of doses, not large doses. Yes. Yeah. Each class with you where I would notice something and I go, wait, wait, what about that? Yeah. And then she'd take a second and go, oh, blah, blah, blah. So it's like pop up. It pops up because I'm now curious about it. The question is coming from the learner, not coming from the teacher wanting to give yeah. it to you. And that is, that's key. It's so cool to see students be like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> I'm noticing something here. And then they lean into it. And when you lean in, then it's clarifying something. Right. as opposed to you're dumping a bunch of information on students, so. Right, I, I think that's really cool when you talk about pop-up pop grammar, okay? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, because students, they notice something, they become the detective in the language classroom, and they detect something they don't know, and they say, wait, what is that? I think that is really fun because the curiosity actually will help the students to learn and actually eager to learn more of the target language. Yeah. So I, I totally, um, I, I think sometimes I would add new things in a class and then you will find the detective will come out and say, wait, did I just hear that thing three times? What is that? And I think, you know, in order to, you know, make things more interesting, I think this is definitely a great way to, to add the grammar element in the lessons, but not focus on the grammar itself, but use the language of embedded, you know, stories and to, to kind of lead to the curiosity and then talk about it. 
Absolutely, it's exactly. Spot on. The last thing I would say about that is um, language, um, grammatical elements of language are acquired uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a specific order that you cannot change. So um, we need to also trust the process that it's only through um, communicatively embedded input that the brain is going to acquire the elements it needs. So I could try to teach Rochelle the subjunctive in French now, but that's going to happen. That's going to be acquired when it's acquired. It doesn't get acquired early. It's fine for me to point it out or for her to hear it. It'll be there, right? But until she's naturally at that point of acquiring that thing, it's not going to happen. Um, the S, third person singular on a verb in English, like he eats, is a late acquired structure, very late acquired for non-native English speakers. Um, and probably for native English speakers too in their first language, but it is usually taught early because it's like, well, that's really easy, right? I eat, you eat, he eats. And yet we, and, and teachers all over the world get frustrated with their students. It's like, I taught you that in the first week, but it's a late acquired structure. So we have to just trust the process. Yeah, that's right. I like the word we have been using, acquire the language. That means it has become a part of you. It's, it's in there already. So I, I think that's something very important. And then, you know, through the, the, the uh, input. So we talk about grammar, now we understand. But how about culture? Because, you know, when you speak two languages or you're learning another language, doesn't really mean you're like a multicultural. So how do you teach cultural, actually, in a comprehensible input environment? Thank you for the question. It's a great question, right? Because this is one that uh, we often feel pressure about because it is assumed that when you're a language teacher, you're also a culture teacher. And culture, like we view it the same way that we view language. We know that culture is acquired. It can't really teach culture. You have to experience it. And so one of the things that we do is just broaden understanding of what are these different elements of culture? What is the culture in the room, right, with us, with our students? So if we start with the culture that's in the room, and they can compare and contrast our own experiences, that helps us stay in the target language, it helps us remain comprehensible and compelling. And then the other piece with the, you know, sharing of culture, that's what we are really trying to shift our thinking and other people's around is this idea that we are really culture investigators, like you had said before about being investigators as to what's going on with grammar. So we try to shift away from this idea we have to be an expert on generally someone else's culture. Most language teachers in the United States are not native teachers of that language. I'm sure Chinese is like is an exception, right? Um, but even then, you can't necessarily speak for all of China. You can only speak to, in my family and in my community, in this region, this is how it's done. Um, and so we try to move away from this monolithic approach of this whole country is like this and this whole country is like that. And instead we go with little tiny doses uh, and make sure that we provide lots of examples of different people and different experiences and begin to ask these questions of, oh, you know, so in this book that we read, you know, this particular thing was really important to this family. Um, so if I was going to pull out my friend, where did she go? Here she is. Where she says, quiero ser famosa, right? And in this story, this little girl wants to be famous, but it starts off where she is baking cookies at home. And then her family comes in to tell her all these different ways that maybe she could be famous. Clearly, part of the culture going on in the story is the kitchen being the center of where the family gathers. Right, it's where discussions happen. This is where, you know, family walks in and out. And so I can ask a cultural question of, oh, do people gather in your kitchen? Where do people gather in your home? Like are only certain people in the kitchen? Do people have better discussions in the living room, on the front stoop? Like where in your house does this kind of communication with family have? Those are the kinds of really accessible cultural questions that matter, create heart-to-heart -heart connection, and utilize the culture that's in the room. 
Right, and I think that is something actually, Rochelle, you have you have mentioned. I think it's like a culturally responsive teaching. Right. So, like you know, start from somewhere very small, your own environment, and I think the culture comparison. I think you're not only learning about the culture in the classroom, but also with the people, all the students in your class, and learn to compare to see the similarities and and the differences, and to respect each other. I think that is something pretty powerful, actually, because you know a lot of times. For example, um, I watched Coco, a part of Coco with um, my students, even though it's uh, in a different Latino culture background. But actually then my students realized like some of their families actually celebrate their disease similar the, you know, to their ancestors. And that is how the shared culture coming in. And you become the world citizen of learning, not only the world language, but the world culture. But in you know, small chunks, like you said, and expand from there. Is that a part of the, the teaching? Yeah, absolutely. And when we get into the specifics, then we avoid stereotypes and these broad generalizations, right? When we're talking about individual or small community experiences, um, we really get to the heart of things. And then we avoid um, making just these overgeneralizations about how things are or should be uh, for certain groups of people. So thank right. you. And then we actually talk about like a Chinese teacher. Now there are a lot of non-native Chinese um, teachers that are teaching Mandarin Chinese. And I, that's why it's really nice to have a community. And then we help each other. Then we see different things. You know, if you're from the South, and the, the tradition might be a little bit around those ones are from the North, you know, um, so it, it's different. So it becomes a community helping each other. So, and we're going to move on to some of the trainings. You, you actually both have been great presenters in a lot of conferences, you know, um, from uh, the, the uh, NTPRS, you know, conference, the National TPR, TPRS Conference, and the International uh, Forum for uh, Foreign Language Teaching, and GUAPO, the Greater uh, Washington Area um, Association for uh, World Language Teachers. So you have done so much, and a lot of the uh, presentation about comprehensible input. So um, you also worked it for, you know, like uh, with the schools in District of Columbia, uh, Washington, uh, Washington DC, and to share a lot of your expertise and, uh, you know, um, and train teachers here. So can you talk about how you train the world language um, teachers, you know, to, to know, to learn more, or use adopted the philosophy of comfort sensible input? Great, thank you so much for the question. So it's really exciting. This year we have, um, two different things that are going on. So for those people that live in and around the DC metro area, so Maryland, Virginia, District of Columbia, we've had folks from Pennsylvania as well. We have a uh, monthly training series that starts in November and it runs six months out of the school year where we gather together as a cohort group of professional learners for three hours, once a month, on a Saturday. And in those three hours together, we make sure that you have uh, received demonstrations in target languages so you experience what it's like to be a CI student, as well as the research and the theory behind it. We have been working really diligently on being up to date, current, and basically being your research translators of here's what we think are really the distilled most important points and then how does that apply what does it look like in the classroom so with that series we have two levels we have a level one for people that are starting out and they are trying to just get their footing around what is comprehensible input why does it matter and then how do i apply it and use it in my classroom and then the level two are for folks that either have had some training before and feel like they're just ready, they wanna jump right in, um, and, or they come through level one and now they're ready for level two. Level two, again, we continue to reinforce the learning about CI techniques and CI strategies, as well as the brain research around what we need to acquire language. But then we also are putting a heavy emphasis in level two on what does it mean to be a culturally responsive world language teacher. Mm -hmm. So understanding in greater depth and detail, how can you, now that you've built up some skill in you know, teaching communicatively 
by providing comprehensible input, how can you also then maximize the learning environment for your students to be successful by being culturally responsive to who's in your room and what they need to be ready for success? The other piece of what we have to offer, um, and this works for anybody um, anywhere in the world, yeah. is we have an online membership. Um, these two things are complementary; they don't replace each other. So right. one could be participating both in the um, in-person training and be a member. We've had we have people who are doing that, um, but it's a, a a membership that is twenty dollars a month right now. Um, and although the um, Right now, we're not accepting the brand new members, but you can get on the wait list for when we open up in January. Yeah. Um, so what we're finding is that we're, um, people are, are, are able to take the, the bits that they're getting each week in, in small increments for something very practical that they can take into their classroom, use, try out, and then get the next little bit of learning the following week. So what we're doing is we know that teachers are very, very busy and yes. very overwhelmed all the time. Um, and they may have been to a, to a training, they may have had some, uh, some you know, exciting experience, but now how do you implement what you've learned? So our membership is to help people implement yes. the learning and keep them, give them solid support, uh, solid sustained support all year long. Uh, it includes once a month, a, a live Q&A with us where you can ask any questions. Yes. Um, so it is, uh, that's the other piece of what we're offering right now, along with you know, coming to conferences and doing presentations. So it's like a community of the self, actually, and helping yes, each other, yes. right? It's a community. Yeah. And I think I love the training because, you know, I think, you know, even teachers that they, who don't have any comprehensible input experience uh, before, prior, and they can join your training program and learn how to start from zero and take off from there. I think that is absolutely fabulous. And then you have, after the first level, you can move on to level two and tend to advance your practice in comprehensible input. And after that, you have a community that will be able to answer your questions and to, um, um, you know, ask questions. And then, you know, among teachers, a lot of that, that actually generate a lot of, uh, um, a lot of not just questions, but I feel can be more productive because you will have ideas from each other as well. So that is all that it sounds like a very, really fun and you know amazing uh, training. So where can teachers find you online to say hello, bonjour, um, buenos dias? Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, and then also students, you know, who want to learn French or Spanish from you, where mm -hmm. do they find you? Well, the easiest place would be to go to our website, which is ElevateEducationConsulting.com. All one big chunk. Um, ElevateEducationConsulting.com. And when you head on there, you can either drop us a line through the contact page, or you can, she's showing you, there you go. So on there, there are, basically like four banners. So you've got Elevate CI, and that's where you'll find information about educator training. You have Elevate Language, that's where you can find out about language classes. We also provide French and Spanish classes for French and Spanish teachers. That helps them to keep in the language, increase their own input, and everything that they get in class from us, they can use in their own classrooms. Yeah, advanced classes. Online. So it really is like professional development because you are experiencing a CI classroom, you're discussing, and I found that in my Spanish Spanish teachers class, sometimes I'm like, all right, teacher talk, hold on. Right. Da, 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 da. And we just spend a couple minutes around how would you use this in your classroom. Absolutely. Um, and then you've got Elevate Culture, and that's uh, got a lot of really great resources, as well as information on past workshops that we've done. Um, the membership information is underneath Elevate CI, so elevateeducationconsulting.com is where you can drop us a line, say hello, and register. Okay, so we all have that in the feature post. And uh, anything else, um, Anna and Rochelle, you want to suggest or mention before we wrap up? I think this. I think that uh, what I would suggest to all teachers is to every single day take a deep breath. Congratulate yourselves on getting through another day. Um, you are absolutely critical because you're a teacher. There is no more noble cause than that. 
um, and that you've got this. Like you really can take on a new way of doing things that's gonna just lighten up your life and the light of your students. So that's what I would Anna? Well, that sounds really good to me. <laughs> <laughs> we love teachers. Like we love kids and we love teachers. And one of the reasons we left the classroom ourselves in terms of being in a school was to be able to have a greater impact on more kids by being able to support teachers. Yeah. And so um, it is such a joy for us to get to be with teachers and to make their lives better. Um, it's hard to be a teacher. It's hard work. I mean, just the work of teaching is a vocation. It is a passion. And we want to make your life better so that you can stay in the classroom at least one more year. So yeah. that's what we're here for. So we can do, we do the reading, we do the background. We have the time to do that yeah. so that we can make your life simpler, better, and more joyful. Well, thank you so much, Anna and Rochelle. Um, I am looking forward to talking to you soon. And to everyone who is watching, we'll have the links, um, you know, um, Anna and Rochelle talk about in the featured post and um, at MissPandaChinese.com. You'll find all the information there. And thank you for watching this episode of Interview with Miss Panda. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Bye. Take care.